So here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Mark Kennedy. So that's a doubling every year of your revenue. 
Um, and uh, you could be lumpy that way, you have some months better than others, but typically smoothed out, it should be somewhere around the 10% month of the month. You need to have a very large addressable market, um, and so that's the TAM, as they call it. And, uh, and But they recognize that your money that you're going to get from the VC is not going to be able to succeed in dominating this huge addressable market, but you want to show that you have a specific attack vector uh, to go after a sub-market inside that big addressable market. So you say, well, we can have all of this, this is the whole pie, but you know we can't go after all that because we'll just like run out of dough before we get there. So, uh, but we do know that if we attack this segment of the market and we're successful there, we'll need to greater things, and this is what we want uh, to use your money for. And then a team, you want to show that you've got at this point a very substantial team around you because it demonstrates your ability to persuade other people to join your team and, and you have that um, a growth that's going to enable you to do all the different functions that you need to do to build a successful company. So you talk to a VC and, uh, and now you're going to try to get a term sheet out of them. So term sheet is just the key terms upon which they're going to invest in your company. I'm going to give you this amount of money and I expect to have this amount of shares after the deal is done and whatever other special conditions that they might apply to that deal. Now, in trying to get a term sheet, uh, especially in somewhere like Canada where there's so few VCs that you can get money from, you have a tendency to run into people who fence it a lot. Um, you think about it, you're a VC, you're thinking about investing in this business, every day you delay is to your advantage because every day you delay is less risk for that VC. Just one further day in the history and the sort of longevity of that company that they're thinking about investing in. So it's how do you get them to commit, how do you get them to put the pen to paper and actually issue a term sheet so you can get your deal for the job. That's a really, uh, you know, it's a tricky part of it. For us, it was just a matter of showing that we had interest from other VCs. So you get a little bit of a horse race going and uh, you make, they, the VCs will start to recognize that if they don't get into this deal, the deal might pass them by. So that's the trick that we use in getting a term sheet. Um, after you get a term sheet, you'll go into a due diligence process and um, you know, basically making sure that everything's okay. Uh, one of the key things there is your intellectual property. Now, um, we're a software development company, so we didn't get involved in patents. If you were making hardware, sometimes that's much more applicable. But in the case of um, intellectual property, one of the key things there is to make sure that every single employee you have has assigned the intellectual property of everything that they develop to the company. And that's just to make sure that everything's nice and clean and no one's going to say, well, actually, I did that in my time on my own time. Well, that doesn't matter, see? Whatever, if you're hired by a, a technology company, whatever you do and whatever you produce is owned by that company. Now, the company is doing that not to be greedy. It's because the VC is going to require that of every single person that's touched the code, especially. Anyone that's had any involvement in the product will have expected to assign all their rights, title, and interest in the intellectual property that they developed as part of their job or otherwise into that company. So that's a clean sheet that for the VC, they know they can move forward without getting uh, later on tangled up with someone who used to work for the company and just a little bit of code as a buddy might do on a weekend and oh no, don't pay me and then later on when you're really successful, well remember that code I did and I thought I didn't want to get paid. Well, you know, I was kind of talking to a lawyer and they said I might have a claim there and they said, you know, you're into a great big uh, kind of pitch. So that's the whole idea with the assignment of intellectual property. I really strongly point point the agreements just to make sure that everything's tanked down solidly there. Um, your cap table. So your cap table is your capitalization table. It's who owns the company. That's got to be crystal clear. You can't have some people who may have shares or may not have shares or might have options to buy shares, but you really didn't complete all the paperwork. That has to be really nailed down so that the VC feels comfortable. Again, that there's not nothing going to come out of the woodwork later and really disrupt this uh, startup's ability to be successful. And then one of the things you're driving towards is a VC always buys uh, preference shares, uh, as opposed to common shares in the company. And the terms of your preps, the terms of your prep A shares, um, is, a, is a usually a critical piece for the VC. So my best recommendation is if you get to the spot where that's what you're considering, make sure that you really research all the terms and conditions of typical preference A shares so that you don't get caught off guard or anything like But what's the very first question to ask? Of, uh, whether you're going to you know, take VC, it's do I want the VC money? And it's, if you say, yes, I want to grow a really big business, then VC money is appropriate for you. 
And my second best advice then is get a pro deck made. Now I'm going to show you my deck at the end of the presentation or kind of an extracted form of it. Um, I can't really draw straight lines with the rulers, but I used to do my own decks. Uh, as you often do, it's like a startup CEO and you, you know you have a lot of hats on your head, you do everything that you haven't hired someone to do yet. And so I used to try to put this deck together, I thought it was okay. I would get about two minutes into my pitch and the questions would start, the interruptions would occur, and then you could be using all what I was talking about. And I could never figure it out. So when I decided I was going to go for VC money and I decided, okay, I need someone to do a professional deck for me. So I hired a local designer here. And, um, and I asked her, could you help me put the deck? I gave her a whole bunch of links about the best way to put decks together and what the best practices were. She went out and researched our entire industry. Probably more than we did at that point. She researched the entire VC industry. She looked at a at pile of different kinds of decks and then put together this spanking deck for us. Now, top five grand. Not a lot of money in the grand scheme of things when you're looking for millions. But this deck, I remember the first time I gave it as a pitch, um, I went right through the entire deck, never got interrupted once. And at the end, the VC said, that's the best deck I've ever seen. I was like, wow. So then I gave the pitch a second time, and I got the same response from the next VC. That's the best deck I've ever seen. So I was like, okay, well, I just like, put a bow on this thing, and I put it on my computer. So it made a huge difference, um, the ability for other people to understand your business. And I think sometimes, when you're a CEO and you're a founder and you've been embedded in this business for so long, you start to lose sight of the you know, forest or the trees. And having someone from the outside come in and look at your business cold, they really seem to be able to focus in on some really important things that you might, might have thought were important, but are really critical to the understanding of you and your business and, and what your plan is. So I'll ask you again, you're really sure you want to take DC money. And the question to ask there is, wouldn't you be happy with like $10 million in the bank? Um, I read that once you hit $4 million in personal net worth, the rest doesn't matter. You pretty much got everything you need at $4 million. Bucks. So you got $10 million, you got way more than what you actually need to be happy. So maybe all you want to do is just build a good business, great business, but not a huge business. And here's the reason why you need to ask that question and, and determine whether PC money is right for you. So here's a typical scenario. You start your business, you're looking for angel funding, you're looking for 55,000 bucks from somebody, a couple of people, a rich doctor, two rich doctors, lawyers, some of their kind of money. Um, then, you know, you get a little bit of success, as I said, you get that little bit of traction, you manage to hire one or two people, you think, you might be onto something here, but you know, you need some more money so that you can hire more people, get more product development going, and also manage program funding, which we can do here through a COA or an NFC. So you go out and you look for $500,000 for the seed funding. That's a typical seed round. And then after the seed success, you show, look, you know, we've managed to get even more customers, more traction, we've shown there's a business. Now we, we know that there's a really big business that we had here, but we need this VC money to build a really big business. So you're going to look for something like $5 million of Series A financing. So here's how that works out. You go pre-money, you're going to say, my company at the start is worth a half a million dollars. And I'm founder A, and I got a co-founder, and I got some early employees. And this is how you might want to split up your company between those three groups. So I'll take 51%, my co-founder take 30%, and we put 19% aside just for early employees so that we can share it with them. Because really all, like the first half of those people that come work for your company are all founders, really. They're all taking a risk, they're all giving up jobs, probably good jobs to come work with your shitty little startup with no money and your crappy product and barely any customers. That's a big ask, right? So you want to have them to have a, a, an oar in the water as well so that they, that they feel like if, if they can contribute and this thing's a success, that they'll be successful. So that's why you set some money or some uh, shares aside for them. And these are just theoretical values on how much those shares worth based on the company with the total valuation of a half million dollars. So then you take that angel money, right? And you go, okay, my post angel money valuation is going to be $555,000. I missed some numbers here. I did all this math, by the way, after watching Game of Thrones last night. So I wasn't quite sure what was going to be up on the screen. I don't know if anyone watched Game of Thrones last night, but it was an awesome episode. So, um, so, so what happens is, of course, the angel comes in at, at this uh, 10%, right? And 
And that's that $55,000 they put in. And so what happens then is everyone gets valued and down. So that founder rate was at 51%. They're down to 46%. The person at 30 is down to 27. The employees who are at 19 are down to 17. But now, you know, and they're worth the same amount, not 255, right? Because we're just saying that we were worth 500, we put in 55, now we're 555. So that's just the first time we take money. So that goes all well, and then you decide, okay, I'm going to take that seed money now, that half a million bucks. And you're going to say, post seed money valuation, $2 million. So after the half a million dollars goes in, your company's going to be worth $2 million at that point. That's what you're saying. And that's the pitch that you're making when you go to seek that seed financing. Now the founder rate is dialed down to 41%. BD 24%, the earnings are down to 15. The angel went from 10 down to 9, but the seed came in full 10% because they put in $200,000 and I changed $200,000 into $2 million valuation. But you know, founder A is looking, well, my 41% is worth $820,000 based on this valuation, so I'm doing pretty good. So it's kind of that scenario. You've got enough money that you can actually get some decent product develop, you get some customers, show that there's a business, maybe build a business, it might even be profitable, depending on what your, your plan is. So then comes the tricky part, VC money. So I'm just going to deal with a straight up, up the middle of the fairway VC deal, and that's for Series A, and that's a $15 million post money valuation, and the VC is going to be looking for 20% of their company after they've invested the money and all, everything's about to be fully diluted. And we want you to create what's known as an option pool. We want you to take a certain amount of the company, share-wise, and put it into a pool of those options that you can give to future hires, in case you need to get some educators in, some woman who's a Cracker Jack salesperson, and you want to hire her, and you're trying to feel her away from her good job. Or you say, look, I got all these options I can give you, so if the company's success, you're going to do really, really well. Um, and so the option pool becomes a critical piece. And the VC wants to see that option pool created before they put their money. Because the option pool is going to buy you what is already in there. So the VC says, well, create your option pool, buy you with everybody, and now I'll come in. All right? So the scenario is $15 million plus money VC, fully valued, meaning all the options are accounted for. Now the kind of is down to 28%, but on a $15 million valuation, their interest is worth $4.25 million. Down to 15%, 2.25, down to those. So here we've got the VC at 20%, that's $3 million, their valuation, and the options, a 15% option pool for $2.25 million of the shares that we can give out to those key employees. That looks pretty good. So now, wow, we got this money in there. This VC money. And you're doing great. And you have new hires. And you create new sales channels. And you're disrupting the shit out of your American ordinary and everything. And then it comes the offer. Because as someone alluded to, you've managed to disrupt some market, some big competitors going, oh, they're just a pain in the butt. They just keep, you know, their salespeople come back to the office and say, well, we're doing great, we heard about this great detective saying, and it's got to throw nuts because some of the customers are interested in it, and they're lower price, or they're a better product, or they're light or they have this, they're better customer service, whatever your sort of go to market is that it gains that customer, it's become a major area. And so what's that, you know, big competitor want to do? They want to buy it. Hi, we want to buy it. And you say, for 40 million smack of roots. And you go, wait a minute, I got 28% of it. So you think, wow, I'm going to make 11 million dollars. Happy day. You're going to make happy days. Best day in your life. But see, then the VC looks and they go, well, that's a good thing for us. Because right? the VC was at, BC was at 20%. So $40 million exit, they're going to get $80 million. Now they put $2 million and a bid in, or $3 million, and they get $8 million out. So they're thinking, well, I'm only getting like three times my money. Now a lot of people, three times their money, 300% return on money, that's like, well, they're going to do the back in the, uh, in the stock market. But to a BC, that's not, that's a shitty return. That's not what they're hoping for at all. They're home for a way better return than that. Tremendous risk in their business. Their model is they invest in tank companies. War will flame out. That means like completely destroy themselves. War will be the walking dead, they call it, which means that they're not doing great, but they're not exactly dead. And then two will be probably 
from the outside success, and one of them out of that ten will be a really big success, and that's where we make all the money, that big success, that one big success. And and you know, I, I heard a story the other day, it was this person that put a million dollars in Shopify for an early investor, and they all had 128 million dollars in one public. No, that's a return. 128 days. So VCs need those big returns. It's just all part of the model. It's not greed, it's just the way their formula works, it's the way their own business model works. They have limited partners that invest in these, in these companies they have to report to, and you think they're gonna beat you up. There's nothing like an LP to beat up a VC. They know money like nobody's business, and when you have two people in the room know a lot about money, they know how to beat each other up over. So they just need more, so they're not so happy. So what are they gonna do? They're gonna go, hold on, let's keep it going. They'll kill that too. They won't let you exit for forty million dollars, and you're going to need their consent to do it. Even if you got majority interest, you're going to have conditions in those preference shares and elsewhere that's going to say, "Well, anytime you want to exit, we're going to have to agree with." So the point of the matter is that if you're thinking about, well, you know, I don't want to build this massive business. I'm just happy with sort of a medium-sized business, and if I can put a few million bucks in my pocket, then VC money's not for you. You see money is that you're going, I want to create a really big business. I want to create such a giant enormous business that that VC is going to be filthy rotten rich from my deal. And I'm going to do really well too. So that's when you take VC money, when you want to build a really, really big business. And you have that plan to have to do it. And it's crazy. I mean, I second guess myself every day that we took VC money. Um, and you say, gee, I, I don't know, maybe uh, $40 million would be okay, $10 million bucks in my pocket. But, you know, you just got gargantuan ambitions, and that's what you do. Okay, I wanted to show you my deck now, uh, just as what a pro deck looks like when you're uh, looking for uh, Series A financing. Um, and some people went through, I think, you know, uh, uh, people went through the weekend and got a lot of lessons on how to put a proper deck together. So I, I won't spend time on the intricacies of it. But, uh, first thing, I always have a um, screen uh, that's your placeholder screen because there's always chit chat, small talk before you actually start your pitch. So you want to have uh, just a one slide that can be up there and then just tell them what you need to know. So template for us, when everybody has a hard time pronouncing it, it's actually an acronym task, it's good location, talent, XML. They can tell them what it is, first day. So we're the number one in cloud based production software tools for media creation. Worldwide, globally. Um, they want to hear that you have a co-founder. At least one co-founder. If you say, it's me, myself, and I, I'm the founder, no one else, that's not a good thing to tell investors, especially in VC. They know how much pain it is, they know how much trouble it is to try to get a company to be successful, so they're going to want to see that you have someone along with you for the ride and you can talk to them and commiserate with and, and, and do all those battles. The second thing that we need to show is the team, and then Jillian just pointed this out. Um, and this was our team at the time we did our race. And we actually had a really nice panoramic. And then one guy went to Toronto, so we had to cut him out of the picture. And one guy went back to school, so we had to cut him out of the picture. And that's why we ended up putting up like Lego blocks there. But the idea is like, well, we have a team. We don't have to be voted in because so. and, and the best description of the deck I've heard is that it's a series of unremarkable statements that lead to a dramatic conclusion. So each slide shouldn't leave the VC going, I don't know about that. That VC has to go, yep. Yeah. And then the next one, yep. Yeah. Oh yeah, I got that. Yep, yeah, I agree. All the way through your story until you get to that last slide, and then the last slide is, oh, where it all comes into a crescendo. So hopefully that's what we get here. So the first thing is, well, there's high speed internet. There's inexpensive digital tools. Yeah, that's true. And there's a newly emerged media creation industry. Well, that's true. So that's no taxing any of the sort of assumptions. You're not really requiring them to be the leap of faith there in their thinking. And so we just said, well, for a disruptor, which is what a startup is, that's where you want to be in the market is being disrupted. And then we had to explain, well, how do we fit into the market that we fit into? So, well, there's five stages in the creative production process. And we focus on the first three. Oh, nice and clear. Development, pre-production, production. And we said, well, here's the problem. So the reference they need to show the pain. Here's the pain. This is how we do the business now. Hey, 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 unbelievable amount of paper. And emails and phone calls. Hey, it's like 
the industry stuff back and forth and bugging us. So we said, well, what we wanted to do was take those three first key parts of the media production phase, we wanted to put them into one stop for people to be able to use. And, and at that point, I can talk about different competing products that are out in the marketplace and their shortcomings and how we are better than them because of what we do. And then we said, and now we've got to want to make it an open standards platform so that we can support wherever people are working. And we've got six apps in the iOS store, we've got four apps in the Android store, we've got two OS X apps. We have the number one script writing space at, at the world, the number one storyboarding app in the world, number one OS X storyboarding app, script writing apps in the world, number one cloud in the world. This is what I can talk about when I'm doing the pitch. And the idea is that we can support you on your laptop, we can support you on your Android device, we can support you on your Apple Watch, wherever you want to go. The other thing was, well, what's that all mean? Well, that means that when you go to make a movie or a TV show, there's a whole bunch of people involved, and we wanted to make sure that we can buy everyone with an update really quickly. And so the idea was that having up the file supporting all these devices, everybody could get their information right away. And then that enabled people to kind of collaboration. So we have people working in Singapore, or Toronto, and St. John's. Uh, we make 95% of our money outside of Canada. United States about 40% of our user base. York is about 40% of our user base. Brazil is about 5%. Our top five cities are New York, LA, London, San Paulo, and Sydney, Australia. Um, and so we can show that we support multinational efforts across the globe through the software that we make here in St. John's. Then you say, well, what's that opportunity? What's that huge market that you're going at? Well, what we came across was there's 60 media conglomerates in the world. Comcast is one now, they own NBC Universal. Well, NBC Universal, on average, each of those conglomerates has 6,000 individual media subsidiary companies. So there's 6 million different divisions inside those 60 conglomerates. And there's 600 million people who are employed by those 60 conglomerates. It's incredible. NBC Universal owns 11,000 individual media companies. 30 Rock is one of those. SNL is one of those, just to give you an idea. And then when you get to York, they all have the equivalents of Disney and NBC Universal and Sony Pictures. So we said, well, small medium enterprise, that's our near term. That the longer thing, that's the total addressable market, that's for another day. That's our, our Series A money, that's not going to get us there. Our Series A money is going to get us to our near term objective, and that's $100 billion. So that's the smaller. Market. And who are they? So now you have to explain to people what it is the market you're going after. So for us, it was SMEs, small medium enterprises, and they were corporate branding training, advertising marketing, education training, children's programming, and anyone has a clue who knows. And that's a big business, and that's a big business. So even this small niche that we're going after is a massive opportunity. So I then you have to show your traction, as Jillian mentioned. And so for us, it was at this point, we had 4 million users worldwide. We were available in 34 languages. We're in 200 countries. Uh, we're in North Korea. So pretty much every single country in the world uses our software. And then we wanted to show examples of who they were, because that's easy to say, but like, can you give me any concrete examples? That's always a question you're going to ask. Anytime you talk up on this level, the VC will go right down to the trenches and go, can you give me an example of one of those companies? So anticipating that, we provided them up with ad agencies, video producers, religious groups, and photography studies. And then, and then what we did was we provided examples of each of those different markets. Um, key people like Clifton View, which is a massive uh, American company in Singapore, um, uh, award winning brand fighter, Primal Screen, they do all the Mad Men um, PR, uh, they use their software, and Soap, another Scotia company. We always try to keep a Canadian company in there. Uh, so, we're really just organizations. <coughs> um, one of the oddities that we found uh, uh, about ourselves was that uh, when we went to look at who was using our software, uh, there was a quite a strong segment among the um, evangelical Christians of the United States of America. And you go, what? And it's, they had all those huge cathedrals that they built. They all had great big movie screens. And they had um, more movie screens than the movies. And they all had large media production companies inside their religious organizations. Teams of 25, 50. Joe Witness had 200 media creators in their head office. They all get busy making media. 
videos, full week-long segments, Ricky Productions on Sunday. I said, I know the competition is on Sundays, Disney Channel, NASCAR, Racing, and Golf. So like, if you don't knock your socks off Sunday, you're not coming back to the next one. So they make it a real resume pass. And so next thing they found our software, started using it, big groups started coming to it. Word of mouth spread along them without us making any effort. And next thing we have a big strong customer segment there. They had more money than God, you know? So it's a really good example of an undiscovered market that comes to your product without you knowing about it. Um, the uh, third group were photography studies. Uh, they all had a wedding business on the side and video production companies. Um, and these are Reading Rainbow. We try to use stuff that people might recognize. Uh, Reading Rainbow, the uh, um, LeVar Burton did a Kickstarter, uh, and uh, they raised two million bucks. I think it was a very successful Kickstarter. Big uh, users of our software to make all their uh, video production stuff. Um, Chile, USA. We try to show how global and international. Attraction, we're just trying to show our subscriber growth at the time. So at this point, we had about uh, 10,000 subscribers uh, paying us money to use the service. And then we had um, our gross SaaS, uh, so you just you know, up and to the right, and uh, we're showing up around 110, 120,000 bucks at that point. And you're showing that you have some pretty strong growth trajectories. Competition, as it was indicated, if you say there's no one else in our state, they're going to get out of the rock. Um, one, you're lying, or two, it's such a ridiculously stupid idea that uh, I've been trying before and it's always failed and I don't go near it anymore. So the best thing you can say is when you have competition. And for us, Adobe is one of our principal um, competitors in the marketplace. They came out with a directly competing product against us about five years ago, got a school on us, they repeat everything that we're doing. Um, and so just showing that, well, we got Adobe on our backs, to invest with us, we're really great with this. It means that you've got a big market opportunity because you have a big competitor in the space. Um, and then we can talk about new players, uh, which we like synchronize and how we put them out of business. And then we can talk about the old guys on the draft who are quickly putting them out of business. And then you go right to the ads. That's the call to action. Say, this is how we've done so far. We have found our business of 400. We have some DC money that came in. We really are seeing. Um, two tranches, 2006 and 9, for 1.8. And what are we looking for now? Is it really $3 million and $18 million on post valuation? <clears throat> and what are we going to use that for? Well, that's a three year plan. And then it's a bank. It's going to be managed at bank. So that's a, a pro deck and kind of what one looks like, but it's nice and slick. Um, you can see it's, it doesn't really challenge you at any particular step. But by the end of it, you start to say, wow, that's a big opportunity, and they seem to have a pretty good uh, um, head start, and so we'll invest money in it. So take your time on, uh, on whether you need DC money, because that's the kind of story you're going to have to tell in order to be able to do 